the defense attorneys now realized they had to do something really significant, something that would uh, counter what had ended up being a strong prosecution. Uh, their, their two clients now were in great danger. And one of the things that they elected to do was to bring in sort of high profile uh, witnesses who had been inside uh, the government and had could be seen as having uh, expertise. And in particular, they brought in one man named Morton Halperin. Halperin had been on the National Security Council staff working for Henry Kissinger. They had had a falling out. Supposedly Kissinger had had him wiretapped uh, as a leaker. But anyway, Halperin's there on the witness stand and he is going through and he's saying every one of the State Department cables, telegrams, reports that were classified confidential or secret were mislabeled and none of it, not one message was properly classified and none of them should have been confidential or secret or in any way classified. They did not have national defense information. It was pretty powerful stuff and you could see the jury was paying a lot of attention. When that concluded in the morning, uh, I went back with the U.S. attorneys uh, who didn't quite know what to do and we sat in their offices over lunch and had to make up the cross-examination. So I sat down and I wrote out questions for them. Uh, and I said, here, ask, do this, use this, ask him these questions. So they uh, seemed to uh, trust me. Uh, they took my questions back, come into court. He's back on the witness stand. Now the U.S. attorneys are uh, uh, cross-examining him. And uh, they start by asking him, say, well, uh, have you ever heard of uh, this name? And they give a name, like, uh, Lane Sang. And uh, said, <clears throat> uh, you, uh, you heard of uh, this individual and uh, the role that he's had in the Lao resistance movement. It was uh, from one of our cables. And uh, Halperin says, well, the name seems familiar. I don't know all the details about him or what he's done. Uh, and they uh, said, oh. And then they asked, and do you know about uh, this place? Uh, have you heard uh, Kang Jiu, uh, and, uh, which is a base from which some resistance forces have been operating? And, he said, well, uh, no, I mean, I, I know that this, they've operated around there. And he's giving some answers like this. And there's about three or four questions asking him, does he know something and with a name? And then uh, they get to the first one and said, uh, oh, Lane Sang, uh, yeah, would you be surprised to know it's not uh, an individual, it's the name of a district in uh, Thailand showing that he was talking about it as if it was a person, but it wasn't, it was an area. And they get to the next one. Oh, would you be surprised to know it wasn't a place, a base for rebels. Uh, this is the name of the vice premier in a country. One after the other after the other, my questions let him in, get him to comment, and then showed he really didn't know anything about this. He wasn't the expert. His credibility was destroyed. So, you know, growing up, uh, I always wanted to be an attorney. I wanted to be in the courtroom. I wanted to be Perry Mason. That was all my dream. I want to be Perry Mason, that famous TV lawyer. So I didn't get to ask the questions, but this was my Perry Mason moment to be there engaged, engaging a incredibly smart and capable uh, witness and destroying him with my questions by how clever they were and showing that he didn't really know what he was talking about. This uh, brought the case to a close. I remember being in the 
courtroom when the jury came back in and read out their guilty, guilty, guilty verdicts for both defendants. And the defendants stood up. And the judge was imposing sentence on them. They were both on bail. He was ending the bail. They would be immediately taken into custody. And there in the front row was Humphrey's fiance from Vietnam. Vietnamese had let her go. His uh, effort had worked in that sense, but now he was going to go to jail. Humphrey's father stood up and made a plea to the judge saying, please let me take my son's place just for one night in jail so he can be with his, with his wife, with his fiance. The judge, of course, turned him down. It was this dramatic moment, this dramatic finish, conclusion to what had begun as a seemingly innocuous conversation on kind of a slow afternoon as I sat in my National Security Council office at the White House in 1976. And now after angles in Paris, Hanoi, Alexandria, the case, the espionage case was coming to a conclusion. Actually, there was one more part, the appeals. And the appeals that were made were not about my testimony, I wasn't involved in them, but they challenged the government's right to have video uh, taped him in his workplace, to have opened the packages because they didn't have any warrants to do so. And this led to the creation of what's known as the FISA courts, which are in the news all the time. Federal uh, intelligence special courts, uh, look where uh, the federal government goes and gets a judge to authorize them to wiretap, observe individuals believed to be involved in espionage against the United States and which can then link in Americans uh, who might be cooperating with them. So a case of high, high profile, front page of the New York Times, um, and I was in the center of it almost from the beginning.